A reading from the first book of Samuel. At that time, Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Say on. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh skins. The Gospel of the Lord. So it's interesting to read through the, uh, the first reading today because we know what is happening is that Saul is under the impression that he has obeyed the words of God and he stubbornly stands in that opinion even when the prophet of God is telling him that he hasn't. And so then the prophet tells him why he hasn't, um, but he has this stubbornness against God's word. He feels like he has fulfilled it even though he hasn't fulfilled it perfectly. And so also you have this type of stubbornness in the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist regarding the word himself in the gospel today. We are still within the context of that banquet that the Lord is having at Levi or Matthew's house. After Levi has left everything to follow the Lord, he collects all these sinners and tax collectors around him, and he has that beautiful banquet with the Lord where they are all rejoicing in the presence of the bridegroom and the presence of the Savior. And we know from what happens before this is that at the beginning of that banquet, first the Lord is accused of eating with sinners. And what Jesus does is he reiterates the fact that this is the purpose for which he came. They are missing the point. This is a cause for rejoicing, but they are still stubbornly expecting something else, and they refuse to have their expectations of the Messiah changed, even though their expectations are wrong. The Lord has come for sinners, and that's the response that the Lord gives to them. He says, those who are sick have need of the physician, but those who are well do not. And so what he is saying there to the Pharisees and those who are uh, accusing him of eating with sinners is that they need to see themselves as sinners in order that they then experience the need uh, for the Savior himself. And after that accusation, then it shifts not only to the company that he keeps, but to the fact that they are eating together and feasting. And so the disciples of John, one of the commentators says, there might be a bit of resentment there because the Lord doesn't seem to be continuing what John the Baptist did. John the Baptist was fasting and he was out in the desert and he was, had a very ascetic life. And yet the Lord doesn't seem to be continuing this on. They forget the fact that St. John the Baptist is only a preparation for the Savior and that the Savior doesn't come in imitation of John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist is there in order to imitate Christ. And so while John's disciples do fast, the Lord also brings in another analogy, which is that between bridegroom and bride. He's reminding the disciples of John the Baptist that St. John the Baptist is the friend of the bridegroom the one who is to prepare souls to be united to the bridegroom. And what was interesting is I was looking at again at just a few commentaries on the wedding feast of Cana that we looked at, and I found an interesting line there again, which I'd read before, but I was reminded of it from uh, Pope Benedict. 
And he writes about the wedding feast of Cana, something that I think can also be applied, is helpful to interpreting what's happening here today, which is that when the Lord says, my hour has not yet come at the wedding feast of Cana, and yet he acts anyway, what Pope Benedict says is that the Lord intrinsically links the hour of his passion to the miracle of the wedding feast of Cana. In a certain sense, he unites the moment of his passion to that miracle in a similar way to what he does here at the Mass. But here it is a perfect union. So here at the Mass, the Lord's passion is what we celebrate here. The celebration of the Mass is intrinsically linked to the passion, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what we see also then in the meal today that we're looking at is also an allusion again to his passion because the Lord speaks about the days will come when the bridegroom is taken. And so what the Lord is celebrating here is also another type of prefiguration of what his Eucharistic sacrifice will be. It will be for sinners. It will be the sacrifice of the bridegroom for his bride. And it will also then be their nourishment and the source of grace for them. By referencing his coming passion, he is also referencing the power by which these sinners that are eating with him will be sanctified. And so as we celebrate the Mass today, we remember all of these truths, which were only prefigured in what we read today, but have come to reality and fulfillment in what we celebrate. This is the true banquet, the feast that we celebrate because the bridegroom is with us. This is not a time for fasting because the bridegroom himself is our food. And so we consume him through his word and he nourishes our mind by his truth. And then we feast upon him in holy communion and he nourishes our soul with his life. Amen.